OK, welcome to part two of the. Beginning bioinformatics tutorials. The first thing you're going to want to do is go to Canvas. And in our modules. Uh, you won't see all of that stuff. But you should see uh, data.tar.gz. Let me share my screen. There we go. So uh, once you're in Canvas, uh, you go to the modules and you should see uh, beginning bioinformatics part two and the data.tar.gz. You'll want to download both of those to your local machine because um, that's what we're going to go through today. All right, so once you have those downloaded, this is the Word document. And so today, um, we're really going to get into some, um, I get more useful for bioinformatics commands. So on uh, the last session, part one, uh, I went over mostly how to navigate and how to find your way around in a Unix environment. And uh, today we're going to learn some um, commands that can do some really useful work. And it's not that individually they're super powerful, but uh, one of the great things about uh, Unix is um, being able to pipe them together. So the way that you can put some of these things together, uh, what you'll see is we can do some, uh, actually some pretty powerful uh, bioinformatics just uh, with these sort of simple commands. So first one we're going to learn is tar, which is short for tape archive. Um, most of the time when you get data, so say you've done a sequencing project and um, you have reads to download, they're going to come in a compressed format. Uh, and this is also true if you download a bunch of data from one of the online databases, uh, GenBank or something like that, um, you'll often get a file that looks like that one that you downloaded from Canvas that's called data.tar.gz. Uh, sometimes you'll hear these referred to as tarballs, um, but really it's just a, a compressed file. Um, and the GZ stands for gzip which uh, is just a compression format. So first thing we're going to do to try to unpack this thing so that we can actually use the data that's inside is go to our terminal. This up a little bit. <clears throat> and depending on where you saved that file. So when you downloaded it from Canvas, by default, it probably went to your downloads folder. Um, that would be the standard setup on most Windows or Mac computers. So from my home directory, so hopefully if you finished part one, this, sh this part should be pretty easy. Uh, I'm going to CD to the downloads. Oops. And do ls and look for, oh, of course, I actually put mine someplace else. That's mine. Put that in my downloads folder. All right, so <clears throat> um, you can see I used ls and then I typed in da just because I knew that the, the thing I'm looking for starts with da. And then I hit tab, just like the tab complete um, that I showed in part one. Um, 
you can see that now data.tar.gz is in my download folder. Okay. That shouldn't be a problem for you if you downloaded it straight there, it should have already been there. Um, so no problem. Okay. So the command that's going to do all the work is right here. Tar. And then we want to extract using the gzip. We're going to use verbose, which means it's just going to output um, extra text to the screen to let us know what, what's being unpacked. Um, trying to fit everything on one screen here. <clears throat> okay. And then F will indicate what file do we want to unpack. So I did DAT and then tab to tab complete. That way I know I don't get any typos and hit enter. OK, and so what the verbose option did was tell it to output all this text. So it basically told us it set up a data directory and then a miscellaneous directory inside of that and so on. Uh, all of these files got unpacked in their appropriate directories. So um, I just show you what that looked like on the. Finder. Right, so now I have this data directory. And right there's the miscellaneous folder, GenBank, Rabbitopsis, mixed test files, all the things that you say they got unpacked here. So task 25.1 just gives you a, a chance to play with, like what if I didn't want to extract that to my download folder, right? I didn't specify a place to send the output of the tar command, right? So instead it just unpacked that data directory inside my downloads folder. But what if I wanted to actually put that in my home directory? You could do that using the dash C option and then specify a path. So I'm going to hit the up arrow, right? Up arrow that uses my history to go back and use the previous command. I could use dash C. And then if I give it the tilde, that should you that be the shorthand for my home directory. OK. So if everything went the way I think it should, that now put a data directory in my home directory. So if I go here, look at my home, yep, there it is. Okay, I got exactly the same thing. You have to, th this time, instead of unpacking it to my download folder, it unpacked it to my home directory. Cool. All right, and there's no reason that you need to keep both of those. You can see here I'm still in my download directory. Um, I'm going to actually use something from like we did from last week. All right, the most dangerous command you'll ever learn. So I'm going to remove data. So now in my download directory, okay. So you can see in this is my home directory. I still have that data, but if I go to downloads, I have the the tarball still, the compressed file, but it deleted the uncompressed version. I don't need I don't need to have extra copies of that hanging around. Okay. Now, if I wanted to compress files, what we just did was uh, decompress them or uncompress them. I don't know what the right word is. Um, first of all, we need to go to the directory um, where this thing is located. So I need to navigate to the
the uncompressed data folder. Whoops. So it's in my home directory and I'm going to hit D. OK, D tab isn't enough because I have multiple. So CD data. And just to see what's there. Right? So the exercise here in 25.2 is to compress the Arabidopsis. Directory, so I use the same command tar. But this time, instead of using X, which extracts it, so extract or uncompress. Um, so we're going to extract this archive, or actually, instead of using X, we're going to use C, which means compress it. Uh, we're going to use the gzip again and use verbose file. And so the file name that we want to give it, this is the thing that I always get backwards. Um, is that first we want to give it the name of the archive that we want to make. So this is going to be the new file name, and then we tell it which directory do we want to compress. And we want to compress the Arabidopsis directory. All right, so use the tar command to compress using gzip. Verbose. The new file name is going to be arabidopsis.tar.gz, and what's going to go in that directory? The arabidopsis. Sorry, what's going to go in that archive or that tarball is the arabidopsis directory. So I'll hit enter, and you can see the verbose <clears throat> is telling me that it is archiving, that's the A, where up above we got X because it was extracting, now it's archiving the Arabidopsis directory. So now if I do LS, actually let me do that. So now you can see we have the Arabidopsis directory, but we also have this tarball or compressed archive of that whole directory. Okay. Uh, I put a funny cartoon here because I can, and <laughs> it's not just me, otherwise this cartoon wouldn't exist. I, th I thought it was funny that I'm not the only one who has problems remembering what the options are for the tar command. Um, so, right, it says, Rob, you use Unix, come quick, and they're trying to disarm this bomb. Um, to disarm the bomb, simply enter a valid tar command on your first try. No Googling, you have 10 seconds. Uh, and then he stares at it and he says, Rob, he said, I'm sorry. Um, right. Fortunately, there's no explosion if you get the, the tar command wrong. Um, I end up often Googling uh, because I don't remember the CZVF if I'm compressing or the XZVF. Um, right, because it's not that often that you have to decompress it. Usually you're downloading it one time, decompressing that data, and then working on it for days, weeks, months, whatever. All right, let's look at some of that data. If we want to look at files, one of the most common ways to do it is to use less. Uh, this is going to list the, the contents of a file one page at a time, and a page in this context is basically how big your terminal window is. So, We're going to send the contents of the Arabidopsis protein.fasta file. So we need to navigate to that directory. Actually, we wouldn't have to navigate. You could use less and then just specify the whole directory. But I'm going to. Um, well, let me just show. Oh, I can do it this way. 
So we know it's in home directory data Arabidopsis. Oops. So um, something that you may notice if you're using tab complete a lot is that in this case, if I do a tab, it fills in the T dash or T underscore because that now there must be more than one file that has a T underscore. So I'm going to tab it twice and indeed I have AT genes and AT proteins. AT stands for Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, it's a common model system for a plant. Plant model system. Um, and so we're going to let's look at the protein up fast. So OK, I'm going to do less on this file. OK, and you should get output that looks like this. OK. <coughs> Now, if you have a mouse with a roller wheel, it actually works on, in this on most systems. Otherwise, you can use spacebar to go a page at a time. And whenever you're done, okay, you can hit Q, and that will exit out of less. Well, let's say we didn't want to look at the whole file or list a whole page. We just want to know, say, what the first 10 lines or the last 10 lines are. There are two commands, head and tail, that will do that for us. Just to save myself some typing, I am going to navigate to the Arabidopsis folder. And exercise 27.1 says use head to find out whether chromosome 1.fasta contains DNA or protein data. So I'm going to do head on chromosome 1.fasta. Now, right, I didn't specify this relative path because I am currently in the Arabidopsis folder, right? So knowing where you are tells you how much of the path you have to specify here. And I did CH tab and it filled in the rest, so I know I'm in the right place. OK, so that looks a little weird because my window there, so I stretch my window. So DNA or protein sequence definitely DNA sequence. How can I tell? Well, if it was protein, I would see amino acid codes here instead of nucleotide codes. So by default, the head command will give you 10 lines. If I only want to, so the example I'm showing here, if I only want to see five lines, okay, I hit the up arrow to give me my last command. I'm just going to add the dash five. <clears throat> and you can see now instead of getting the first 10 lines, I only got the first five lines. If I wanted to get more lines than 10, I could just say, you know, give me the first 50 lines just head dash 50 and then the file name. OK. So um, same thing goes for tail, right? I could use tail. Um, let's just say 15. And there it gave me these are the last 15 lines of that chromosome one FASTA file. So that's if I want to look at the end. Now, why use less versus head versus um, tail? And it, it all about file size. Um, one of the things that's useful for less is you can sort of page through the data. It's less is still not loading the whole file into memory. Uh, and the reason that's important is because 
you know, the files that I'm using here for the tutorial are not very big. Um, the the protein sequence file up here. So when we looked at the Arabidopsis thaliana proteins file, um, even that is only 18 megabytes, so not very big, considering that most modern laptops have uh, at least four, usually at least eight nowadays, uh, gigabytes of memory. So that, that's not that much. But the sequence read, so for my latest transcriptome experiments, we have data files that are, say, 40 gigabytes uh, in size. It's a 40 gigabyte text file. You definitely don't want to just open that in any old text editor on your computer because it will bring your computer to a grinding halt uh, because it's basically trying to load all 40 gigabytes into memory and you don't have that much. So what the computer has to do is load as much into memory as the computer allows and then basically continually read write that onto the hard drive that you have. OK, and depending on the kind of hard drive uh, is really going to determine how responsive your computer is after that uh, until you close the file. So that's the advantage of using these things like head and less and tail. So even if I have a 40 gigabyte text file, if I want to look at, OK, what's the format? I can just look at the first 10, 20 lines or whatever using head. Or if I want to see how what does the end of the file look like, I can do the same thing, but use tail. OK, and, and if I'm not sure exactly, I want to look at, you know, multiple sections, uh, I can use less. There are some other advantages to less uh, um, that allow you to search within. But uh, I'll let you play around with that uh, on your own uh, if you're so inclined right because so once you're in what what do i mean what am i talking about right if i use less there um and i start going page at a time you can search and highlight things within here and um we'll, we'll get to an example of that later on um, but just one one way to to um, look for, for example, you could find specific words and just paging through that way. OK, so that's just be aware there are uses for less head and tail, and you need to pay attention to how big is the file that you're trying to open, uh, especially if you're using your Windows or Mac text editors uh, to try and look at things. All right, so next thing we're going to look at is grep. Super useful tool to find patterns in big text files. The FASTA files that we already have been looking at, the chromosome one and the uh, protein file that we looked at. Those are example of FASTA files. This is one of the most common formats that you'll find um, sequence and amino acid data in. And they have a standardized format where every line starts with that greater than sign. It's like a, it's almost, it, it's, it's like a bullet in a bulleted list. So every entry in the FASTA file starts with one of those greater than signs. So if we want to find the beginning of every entry in the FASTA file, we can use a command like grep the greater than sign. And in this case, we're just going to look at this intron IME data FASTA file. Okay. And, and the general format here is we're going to grep. And then there are some options. We're not using any options on this first try. 
But then the pattern that we want to look for in this case, the greater than sign, right? We put that in quotes, and then you tell it which file name you want to look in. Okay. And you can see it kind of scrolled by pretty fast. But these are this is the first this is every line that contains a greater than sign. OK, so note what what do you get back when you use the grep command? You get every line in that file. That matches the pattern that you gave it. Okay. Well, there's quite a few of them. There's so many. I don't even know how many it hit. OK, but we'll, we'll find out how to figure that out in a second. So that produced lots of output, each one of them starting with that greater than sign. <clears throat> what if rather than getting the these are called header lines? So the line in the FASTA file that tells you what the sequence belongs to. Actually, let's look at this file. So if I use less, right? This is what, what's inside that file that we just grepped. OK, and so grep pulled out each one of these lines that matched the greater than sign. So those are called header lines. And then after every header, you get the sequence. One of the cool things about grep is that we can use the same command to get everything that doesn't match. So going back here, grep options pattern. So now I'm going to use the dash V option. Whoops. And this will give me the inverse of the pattern match, meaning it will give me all of the lines that do not match that greater than sign. OK, so we got even more output. And it gave us all the sequences without the headers. OK. All by itself, that might not seem super useful. Um, but there, there you'll see later that there are cool uses for things like that. So how do we pipe things? Uh, I said at the beginning that one of the things that makes these commands useful is that you can string them together. Uh, and basically take the output of one command and send it into another command. So in this case, right, it streamed all of those sequences right by us without um, stopping until it got to the end of the file. So let's say we want to find all of the perfect AT, AT, AT microsatellites, okay? This is the shorthand for that Micros AT microsatellite that is five repeats long. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna use grep. Actually, let's do eight. One, two, three, four, five. And we'll do it. Okay, that wrapped. So just to be clear what's going on here. Okay, pipe that into less. Now the spaces, uh, in case you're curious, uh, after and before, right? I could have a space here or not. It doesn't really matter. It will work either way. Okay, so what did it do? Uh, same thing as previously with grep. So it's returning every line that has five AT, 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 AT's in it. But 
it stopped when it got to the first page of output rather than stopping when it got to the end of the file. So if I hit the space bar, OK, it sent another page of output. So I could keep hitting space. And it's sending me one page at a time. I can also use the scroll on my mouse to go back and forth. OK. Right, but now it's using less to buffer the output. OK, so I'm not getting uh, the giant stream of the you know running to the end of the file. So we get some control over the output. OK, now like I had mentioned a minute ago, just show you here uh, this example of. how you can highlight, right? So I typed the forward slash and then my five ATATs and my the, the less program highlighted all of those matches. Right. I could, right, if I only want to know where there are, well, let's do, how many of that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See if there are any seven repeat long microsats. Okay, there are actually some really big ones in there. Okay. And the cool thing is less now lets me control looking through that file for all the matches. Right. And I'm not limited to patterns that I had grepped, right? This is now I'm completely inside the less program. This is a, a, a highlighting of text is is the less program it has nothing to do with grep. Grep just was like a prerequisite to find the AT that repeat five times and return every line. But instead of returning to the screen, it's returning it to the program less. And thus, less is giving me all all control of uh, what I'm seeing on my screen. So, see if there are any GTCs in there. See, I can I can search for any pattern, and now those patterns are predicated on the fact that they occurred in a line that had five AT 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 ATs in it. Okay. So when it says end, that means it's gotten to the end of the file. <laughs> little red warning here. Um, if these sequences in my FASTA file are, are broken by line breaks, then that AT5, if it wraps from one line to the next in the actual sequence, grep won't find it. Because grep sees line breaks as actual characters and so it would be like um, or up here, this AT, and then grep sees a new line character before it goes down here and starts looking for more. So if your pattern is broken across line breaks, then grep won't be able to find it. OK, so that was looking within a single file. Grep can also be used to search across files. And you can also, um, well, one of the ways to do that, you could give it multiple files. You can also uh, use wildcards like we did uh, when we were specifying file names um, in part one. Right. So remember what the asterisk or the question mark did when we were specifying file names. <clears throat> Another sort of useful tool is grep I, where you can ignore the case. So, for example, if you have a FASTA file that has some upper and some lower case uh, letters in it, you might want to use the ignore case option. Uh, and lowercase letters, depending on your um, your what generated the FASTA file. Uh, sometimes they use lowercase letters to designate 
um, low confidence base calls in a sequencing project or an assembly, something like that. Um, also, never, don't don't forget you can always use. I, I'm introducing all kinds of typos into these documents. <laughs> um, you can always use the man. Grap, that won't work. Grap. Right. If you want to know what all of the options are, you can use man, or obviously, like I said in part one, uh, learn to be a good Googler. Um, so there are loads of options that you can use with grep. Grep is a very powerful tool. So just to try a couple of these, let's use case, uh, ignore case and ACGTC. OK, so remember the grep format, grep, option, pattern, and then the file that you want to look in. So in this case, I'm saying star. That's going to match any pattern. Or, or any file name, OK? And then I'm going to pipe that output <coughs> into head. So this is only going to give me the first 10 lines of whatever grep matches here. OK, so how does the output differ from what we did before? Okay, so if you have a look at our output, the main thing to notice is it's telling us which file it, it, it found that line in. So where did the output come from? So the first three lines it found in the protein.fasta file, and then the rest came from chromosome one. Obviously, this is, this is a nucleotide search. So it didn't find very many of those in the protein file. Right, A, B, A, C, G, and T also have amino acid equivalents, but right, it's a 1 in 26 instead of a 1 in 24. Because there are 24 options for amino acids and only four options for nucleotides. So you would expect a pattern like that to occur way more rarely if you have a 1 in 24 chance at every position than in a nucleotide, just by chance, you're going to get that far more frequently. We'll, we'll talk about that, those kinds of probabilities of finding things in sequence a lot more in a few weeks uh, when we talk about the likelihoods and, and how do you match um, motifs uh, in DNA sequence or amino acid sequence. So that la the, the last example there, or second example, right? We could do the same thing with tail. So now, notice there was a little bit of a pause, right? Because grep was finding that pattern in all of the files in this directory. And it had to wait until it got to the very end of all that searching to give me the last 10 outputs. And it happened that the last 10 outputs came from this intron FASTA file. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is going to be the briefest of introductions to regular expressions. Regular expressions can be super powerful. Um, they can be a little complicated to know exactly how to um, search for the pattern you want, but there are websites that will help you build um, searches based on, on a specific pattern. So in this case, I have an example here where we're going to look for 
sequences in on chromosome one that start with an ATG, right? That is the start codon for a protein coding sequence. And they stop with a TGA, so they, they have a stop codon. And they also have at least three AC dinucleotide repeats in the middle. So hopefully this starts to pique your sort of curiosity that you might actually be able to do something interesting with just the grep. And, and learning a little bit about regular expressions. So in this example, the way I tell grep that I want ATG at the beginning of the pattern is this little caret symbol. So that tells it, okay, at the beginning of the match, it has to have ATG, okay? The dot says match any character the asterisk says match any number of times. So this is, you know, unlike in the Unix default shell program, like the star here is any character, any number of times, that's going to match all of the um, file names. In a regular expression for grep, I have to first say, any character and then the star or the asterisk says any number of times okay so i need both of those symbols there and then my ac ac repeat three times and then any number of any character again and then at the end and i specify the, that tga has to happen at the end by putting the dollar sign right after it okay so that says that that those three characters have to occur right before or right at the end of the pattern match okay and put that in quotes and then tell it where to look in chromosome one, pass day file. And it found three lines. Right. And so you can see each of these start with ATG somewhere in there. Actually, so you know I don't I can't see it super easily. So I could use that thing. How do we look at it? Let's pipe it into less. And even so, even though that said end, whoops, come on. I hit the forward slash to get into my search engine and find my three, my, my AC repeats. So there they are. So they all start with ATG. They all have the AC repeats and they all end in TGA. I'm going to let you do 31.1 on your own. Uh, make sure you go through that though, because this is really going to teach you about some of the regular expression stuff. And something that I encourage you to do is try to predict what those things are going to match. Okay. So when you search ACGT, obviously you should expect it's going to have to match ACGT. But what happens here when A dot dot T? Okay, what's your expectation? I told you that the dots match any character, so it should be A and then anything and then anything and then T. So all the pattern matches should be four characters. But what happens here? Okay. So make sure you can predict and that what you predict actually works uh, when you when you look at at the output.
So 31.2 is basically what I just did to look for ACAC, except it's showing it's going to show you that you can use um, regular expressions inside less. So let's just go back here forward slash to get into my editor. Okay. The first one, obviously that was my search pattern, basically, except for the ACs, right? All I did was leave out the ACs in, the, in this pattern relative to that original search. So it highlighted the whole thing. But what happens if you do that one? Okay, I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll let you find that out on your own. A oh, little little pro tip there. Less keeps its own history. Whoops. Yeah, I gotta put all kinds of typos in there. Whoops. Right. So. So what I did was that same command, except now I hit the forward slash to get into the search engine in less, and I'm just using my up and down arrows to cycle through those searches that we've made previously. Okay. Nice little, little tip there. Um, I've provided a regular expression uh, quick reference guide because, like I said, this is a very powerful tool uh, when combined in the grep searching. Um, I'm not sure how useful this guy, I mean, this is one of the most useful ones I could find, but you can also Google, like I said, there are websites um, that are designed to help you build the regular expression that you want. I'm not gonna spend uh, too much more time here just because there, there's so much to know about regular, specifying regular expressions that you know we could spend a day and and it's not really something that you remember or or need to remember because you just when you need to design a specific regular expression you can um just kind of look it back up and and most of what you want to do i I've, I've gone through now with this right most of the time you the most common things you would want to do are specify a pattern that happens at the beginning or the end or has some variable characters that you don't really care about that are interspersed within the pattern that you do care about. Um, I, I talked about when we first ran our grep command and it spit out um, the output all the way to the end of the file, how we didn't even know how many lines it had returned. Well, one way to fix that is to use the dash C, which is the count. So now in that intron file, we're going to find out how many of basically the headers because I know it I2 is not going to occur in the sequences. So how many intron twos are I2s are in this intron file? So notice it did not find I well it found all the I2s, but rather than returning all those lines, it just returned the count. So there are 9785 occurrences of I2 in there. So the task here, go back and, and count how many times do those uh, patterns that we were looking at here occur, right? And sort of predict which ones of these do you think to be, will be the most common? 
And obviously you don't know how many A, C, Gs, and Ts are in the file. It's relative. And so how do you judge which one's relatively more common? Well, which is the least specific match? Like what is matching the most variable patterns among all of these searches? I won't give it away just now. So that is a useful thing for you to, to hopefully understand and be able to predict, right? Once you understand these, you wouldn't, de if you understand them well, you wouldn't even have to do sort of the count. You, sh you would just have a good guess for which one is going to be relatively most common. All right, number 33 is the translate command. So now rather than just searching for things, we're actually going to change what's in the file. <clears throat> actually, we're not going to change what's in the file because it's only going to change what gets sent to the screen. Okay, so the sequence files that we've been working with so far are all uppercase. What if we wanted to turn them to lowercase? You know, for example, it, it, you'll be surprised the longer you stay in this, the quirks of some bioinformatics programs. It's kind of the side effect of most of it being open source and developed by individual labs and grad students within those labs. Um, but you know, maybe you come across a software that only works if your sequences are in lowercase. Well, there's this TR translate that can be used to change sets of characters from one to another. Okay, so the general format I'm giving you here, it is TR and then you can specify options just like grep, but then you're going to tell it what's the pattern, uh, what's the set that you want it to look at, and then what do you want it to change it, change that into? And then you have to use this uh, less than sign, okay, which says feed this file name into that translate program. And then I give you some examples here. Right, if you did translate space A space B, that would find set one is just the character A, set two is the character B. So it's going to go through whatever file you tell it and change all the A's into B's. You can also, the reason that this is called set one and set two is because you can tell it, take all of the uppercase letters. So I would do capital A dash Z, and then the set two would be little a to little z. That would change everything from uppercase to lowercase. Okay. And then there are even fancier things where you can give it the option dash d to delete all the matches to the set that you give it. So if I give it a dash z, capital A dash z with the dash d option. I could delete all the uppercase letters. Example here is, you know, you could do 0 9, that specifies all the digits, and I could delete all the digits in, the, in and out. And this, um, less than sign that's used here. Uh, it's just one of those things. That I, I forget it myself often which commands need it and which ones don't. This is called a read file redirect. So far when we used less, head, tail, grep, all of those things, we just told it the file name. We didn't have to use the read file redirect. TR is just one of those quirky ones where you have to use the that less than sign to tell it which which file to to use. I 
think of this like a little alligator it needs to know which, what file to eat <laughs> when it's going to do is translate. OK. It gets weirder uh, because if you are using translate in a pipe, you don't have to use the read file redirect. Translate automatically knows when it's the second thing in a pipe that it's going to use the output from the first part. So if we did this command, right, so I'm telling it just get the first line from chromosome one fast A and pipe that into TR. Okay, so what's that going to do? It's going to change all of the capital C's into capital X's. So, um, right, the first line, let me not pipe it so you can see what it, by default, right, if I just list the first line in chromosome one fast A, it looks like that. When I piped it into TR, CX, it changed that capital C to capital X. Okay, kind of a silly example, but you hopefully get the idea of what TR can do. So, <clears throat> task 33.1, return the first two lines. So we'll head that. Pipe it into TR. And now I need to specify sets. So I want it in, what does it say? All in lowercase. So tell it A to Z. I need to change to lowercase A to Z. All right. And because it's in a pipe, I don't have to tell it. I don't have to use the redirect. It's just going to gobble up whatever the head sends into that tr command okay so there they, there's the output and all of those capital letters got changed into lowercase in my sequence remember we were looking at those before this the file is actually all in uppercase but tr changed it into lowercase And I, I mentioned this uh, sort of accidentally as we moved on to this one. It did not actually change what's in the file. It, it used the head command and the translate command and sent them to the screen. It did not do anything to modify the original file. So, for example, okay, and, and you could have already seen this in that TRCX, and then I redid the command without the TR, the translate, and you can see the original file still has that C. Okay, but I'm going to do that again just to make this point clear. I'm going to relist the first two lines, but not use translate, and you can see the original file is unchanged. So I did not actually make everything lowercase in the original file. I only changed the output to the screen. OK, and so that should tell you if you want to save the changes that you're making, there must be a way to send it to someplace else. So you must there must be a way to save it. So we'll get there. As we go. OK. The stream editor said. One of the nice things about said that's different than translate is that, well, partly it lets you use regular expressions. Um, whereas, you know, we used grep to, to use to find patterns in a file said will let us look for patterns and then edit them sort of 
as it goes through the file, right? So it's a, it's a stream editor. So as it basically does the same thing as grep, but when it finds the pattern, you're going to tell it to change that pattern into something else. So, right, for said, this is how the format looks. We're going to give it um, in quotes. S stands for the substitution mode. Okay. And then what pattern do we want to find? Separated by forward slashes and then the pattern that we want to replace that with. And then the file name. Okay, we don't have to use the read redirect. Something to note here uh, about the quirks of said relative to TR. Said has the same problem that grep does in that it can't, it sees new lines as characters. So it won't read across lines if there's an, if there is a uh, line break. Okay, just like translate though, it's not modifying the original file, it's just changing the screen output. Okay. And we'll we'll learn how to save the stuff uh, later. So task 33.1, change the first word of the first header in chromosome one fast a to chromosome one. So literally we want it to say chromosome one. So to do that, we need to figure out what pattern do we want to match, and then this is the pattern that we want to replace it with. So first of all, and we've seen it already, but let's list the first line, right? Actually, let's just use head on chromosome1.fasta. Okay, so what's the first line in this file? It's the first fast A header for the first sequence. So we want to change this to chromosome one. So let's take the first line, head dash one of chromosome one fast A, pipe that to said and this says change the first word of the first header. So I don't want to change this whole line to say chromosome one. I want to just change CHR1 into chromosome one. So change, whoops, S forward slash. Okay, go back up here to the format of a said command. So that's the pattern I want to match. The replacement pattern is chromosome one. Okay, so said quotes s forward slash chr1 slash Oh, man, I can't spell. 
chrome. There we go. Chromosome one. And let's see what happens. OK. So that's my output. You can see the first word was changed from CHR1 to chromosome 1. And the questions there, I've, I've kind of addressed them. Pattern we're trying to match. OK, so that was the CHR1. How can we do it most efficiently? I kind of glossed over the question, but that's why I did this head dash one so that I only had to analyze or said only had to do the substitution on the one line, right? I grabbed one line and then used set on that one line. I could do this the other way around, but it would take a lot longer, right? I could do said. I could do that said command first. Right, that is still going to work. Oops, except that I have to tell it which file. I think this will work. I could do head one on the output of the said command. And well, <laughs> that analyzed so fast that <clears throat> probably because the file is not very big. I'll show you later how to time things to know which way is faster. But um, right, these two things did the same thing, but you'll just kind of have to take my word for the fact that this is more efficient because it grabbed one line and then did the edit on that line. This had to look at every line in the FASTA file, do the substitution where it occurred, and then only report the first instance. OK. This one could be dangerous if, if that FASTA file has lots of matches and lots of substitutions. The said output is having to be stored in memory until it can spit out the head dash, the, the first line of that output. Um, and then a, a word of red warning about global substitution. Um, by default, the said command only matches the first ma the first time on a line, so it finds chromosome the CHR1 and does the substitution, and then it will go to the next line. It won't continue to look across that line unless you give it the G option at the end to say global substitution. So anytime it finds that, um, it will make the substitution. OK, if we ever want to know how many changes uh, are being made, sort of like grep had that built in um, dash C option to, to tell us how many matches. Sometimes we just want to know how big is the file. And that is word count. Uh, the command word count. So if we want to know how big is the AT genes file. The GFF file. <laughs> so this tells us how many lines there are 50. 531,497 lines. There are, what is that? 4.7 million words. And it takes up 39 million, a little over 39 million bytes. Okay, so in terms of memory or storage size, that's how big the file is. Oftentimes, knowing the number of lines is enough. Um, it 
if you just want to know the number of lines, you can do dash L. And it will just tell you how many lines. I think dash W, you know, for example, if I just want to know words, right? And then B would be for bytes. Okay. So I told, whoops, so far, most of what we've done, actually everything has not been changing the contents of a file, but all of those changes, the, the TR and um, said, don't save what the output. They send it to the screen, but then it's lost. So the redirect will let us, either create a file, so a single greater than sign. OK, this is not the same. We're not talking about the greater than signs that we saw in the FASTA files that worked like bullet head, bullet points for the header lines. This is on the Unix line. If we put a greater than sign, it's saying, OK, write this file. So the read file redirect was the sort of alligator that eats the file name. The write file redirect points at sending stuff into that file, OK? If you use two of them, uh, it's not creating a new file. It's appending whatever the output would be onto a file that already exists. OK, so everything so far sending to the screen is called standard output or STD out. Uh, now we're going to use the write file redirect to send it to a new file. Little warning here that write redirect will overwrite a file by default. So if you specify the new file name, whoops, if you specify a new file name and that file already exists, then it's just going to overwrite the file and you'll lose what you had. Okay, so be careful to rename your files and not, not overwrite things. Okay, so besides the FASTA, we already looked at the GFF file with uh, word count. And GFFs are a common file format that we will talk more about uh, along the way. Um, they are usually being used to specify the characteristics of a, a FASTA file. That, so it's in a uh, genome sequence, for example, you'll have a, fat, a GFF file that tells you where the genes are in those genomes. So our GFF file might tell us where the introns are and where the uh, coding sequence is in that chromosome one FASTA file, for example. Okay. So we're going to play around with some of this data from the, the using the genes GFF file. And this is kind of a, a trick that you'll you know, want to keep in your toolkit when you're trying to new programs. Uh, it's often useful to use kind of a pared down data set. I, I told you that you know sometimes our files are 40 gigabytes of read data. And if we have if we're trying to develop some new pipe pipeline, it doesn't make any sense to try to troubleshoot the pipeline on all 40 gigabytes of that data. So we're going to create a subset of the data by using our head command. So in this case, right, how big is, um, you know, that, that AT genes GFF file is 4.7 million lines. Wait, is that right? Actually, I think I had the number wrong. <clears throat> oh no, uh, the number of lines is 530,000 lines. Okay, that was words. So we don't want to work on all 531,000 lines in that GFF file. 
we're going to use head to say just get 10,000 lines from the GFF file and put it in a file that we'll call subset underscore at underscore genes dot gff and just a word here i have not um mentioned this before i think unix hates spaces in file names so do not put spaces in file names or directory names it will give you all kinds of problems okay so that's why i wanted to call this subset at genes gff so i but i needed I need to put underscores instead of spaces, right? So no spaces in file names or directory names. If you did that by accident before I've mentioned this, um, you've probably already run into problems that arise from that. Okay, so I hit enter. Um, you can see super fast. L, if I do LS, you can see now I have a whoops. Come on. Now I have a, a file here called subset. I can do word count line on subset. OK, you can see there are 10,000 lines. In that file. So here's a question. What if you wanted a subset file that only had the first 5,000 lines of the original file, but had each of them twice? Hmm. Well, I can think of a couple ways, but one way would be to do actually, let's do this. So, this was my original creation. I'm going to do head, take the first 5,000 lines from that original GFF and make it the subset. Now, I'm not renaming this, so it's going to overwrite the one that I created a second ago. Let's word count that thing. Oh, that's not it. Into my history. OK, well, whatever. How many lines are in the subset file now? Oh, there are 5,000 of them. Okay, so indeed I did overwrite the subset file with the first 5,000 lines. Now, right, this question was how can I get the first 5,000 lines, but I want all of them in there twice. So I'm going to run that same command, but instead of overwriting, I'll use the append redirect. So now it's going to stick those 5,000 into that file, but not overwrite it. It's just going to stick them onto the end. So now if I do how many lines are in that file, I have 10,000. So I've got the first 5,000 lines twice. And then a bunch of big, red, bold, I, I can't um, emphasize it in text enough. Do not mix up read file and write file. I've already said what the difference is. Um, everybody who does this long enough makes this mistake once, and it's always bad. Um, right? You. you and instead of feeding a file into the said command, you actually accidentally send it to write the command. And because right, you specified a file name that you wanted it to read, that thing all that exists. That's a file you want to work on, but you accidentally did the right file. Okay, so you meant to read the Arabidopsis GFF and use said, 
but you accidentally put the right file redirect, what happens? Well, if it doesn't find any matches, it has zero output and it overwrites your data file. The one that you were trying to work on, it actually overwrites it. Um, like I said, it, it happens. The way to protect yourself is always, if you have a data file, make a copy somewhere and don't work on that file. That is your backup. Um, yeah, make sure you, if, if you have important data, never work on that data directly. For, for you wet lab people, it's always like having an aliquot of a special or important reagent that you are not sticking your pipette in all the time, okay? So protect your data in, in red, bold, underlined. 